first um, demo, we have um, Wayne Stratman from Stratman Design. He's going to be showing us. Um, <laughs> Okay, yeah. Uh, well, thanks uh, for inviting me to, to demo here. Um, some of you who know me know me that my, my career for the last three dozen years is making stuff that lights up for museums, great shows, movie sets like Star Trek and things like that. So all the glass I make eventually gets <clears throat> filled with gas and energized to light up in some manner or form. So today's demo uh, is a technique I've just developed. Um, it's actually in my new book that's coming out soon, uh, The Art of Plasma. And so that uh, you guys as glass blowers, you can make a hollow form tall as this room, never have to stick it in the kiln and still process it to be absolutely pure neon, krypton, whatever type of gas you want to put in there. So I'll, I'll be showing you that. Um, so we got, I'll explain some of the cobbled together stuff we have here. And uh, before I do that, I guess I'll show you where we're going. So, Trina, could you kill the lights, please? Oh. <laughs> oh boy. So this is where ultimately I want to go to. This is an identical piece here. I'm going to switch here. <laughs> So, the perceived wisdom, and I'm sure some of you have made neon and whatnot, is you've got to make the hell out of the glass in your vacuum to get all the contaminants out, all the water vapor that sticks to the inside like you know, a sponge. And that's true. Uh, this new technique I'm going to show you will do all that via a tiny pill we put inside. Americans love pills. <laughs> and that pill, when chemically activated, will absorb all the remaining impurities. So this tube, I just made it. It's not going to kneel, nothing. I just uh, processed it just exactly like you'll see today. And um, activate that pill in about 24 hours, because the gas has to cycle down to the pill. Um, it turns this color. So, uh, and I've done many, many pieces this way. So, um, and also talk about how cheaply you can actually do this. So, you know, the lights on again. So, originally we, uh, I thought I could use this tiny little vacuum pump that Dave had. It's like a $59 Harbor Freight mm -hmm. <coughs> one, but that was a little bit too small. <clears throat> so this is a, about the smallest, cheapest vacuum pump you need. Um, you can buy these online for a hundred bucks probably. <clears throat> it's providing the vacuum, but you don't have to have a high vacuum system like all the texts say. It, all you have to do is get below the final filling pressure. That's all you need. So we're going to fill this to about six millimeters in pressure. So if this can get down below six, you're fine. So that means you have really, really cheap pump. You need something to measure the pressure inside of this thing to measure that six millimeters. So I've used a little absolute pressure gauge here, <clears throat> but you're all glass blowers. You can make your own manometer in a half an hour and self calibrating and more accurate than this could ever be. And down here, you need a, a tank or whatever gas you want to fill with, with a good valve. That's all you need to process these things. Um, no kilns, no nothing. One other piece of gear you're going to need is an induction heater. Um, induction heater will heat metal parts inside here without heating the glass. It induces a current in metal things and causes them to go to full incandescence. And um, I'll, we'll use that just to bake up this electrode. So <clears throat> I've been running this vacuum pump for a while just to get the Oil warmed up. Shut that off now. So, those of you who maybe want to make notes or whatever, what I'm using oops, are these getter pills. If you can see them, <clears throat> they're really small. They're about the size of a grain of rice, and that little pill will absorb all the impurities in this whole whole source. Sorry, sir. Exactly. Wayne, is that zirconium? Zirconium. Okay. It's a zirconium alloy. Okay. So, 
getters go back about 150 years to the mid uh, 19th century where they started to find lots of materials that absorb water vapor, or absorb oxygen or whatever. And over the past you know, century and a half or so, they've been constantly improved, improved, improved. And now the state of the art is the zirconium alloy. Zirconium is extremely reactive. And you can think of getter as like unrusted iron. Put unrusted iron in the presence of water, it forms rust. Well, this forms its own form of kind of rust, which is an oxide, basically chemically absorbing all these excess gases and locks it up and leaves the tube pure. And a matter of fact, the getters will absorb <clears throat> oxygen, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, water vapor, and what they will leave behind are anything that can't be chemically bonded. And those are the inner gases, the encrypton, our benzene. So I actually have a little tube here. A friend of mine found, that, found this effect. I took a tube, just closed it one end, stuck the getter in, closed the other end, no vacuum, nothing. Then activated this getter and it absorbed all the air completely and left the 7% or 7 tor rather of argon that's naturally in the air. So this is now an, an argon filled tube, even though I didn't have to put any argon in, it came from the atmosphere. And all the other, and I can actually light this up and I can show you, those of you who know what an argon discharge looks like, this is perfect. So it's a pretty powerful technique. Um, <clears throat> so I'm gonna break the vacuum here. By the way, those of you who are interested in doing this, these are ultra tour fittings. If you're not familiar with them, greatest thing around for building vacuum systems. You just stick it on the glass, uh, tighten that fitting, and it makes a good vacuum seal. So, let's see. So I'm gonna cut open one of these things. You might be wondering, <clears throat> well, if these things are so chemically active, how can they be, how can they exist in, you know, out in the open like this. The reason is zirconium, like a lot of metals, let's go in there. <laughs> Demo's over if that doesn't work. <laughs> For example, a piece of aluminum, none of you in this room has ever actually seen aluminum. You've seen aluminum oxide. But immediately when you have aluminum in any atmosphere, an oxide layer forms, and that's what protects it. People say aluminum doesn't, you know, doesn't corrode. Well, actually it corrodes instantaneously, but that protects the rest of the metal. Same with zirconium, it forms an oxide, protects it. And when we heat it, that oxide layer disappears into the bulk and forms a zirconium oxide and leaves the rest chemically active. So let's hope it's done this correctly. Chris is a demo, yeah. Oh. It's, it's the fact that the, as you all know, glass tubing is supposed to be a certain size. And this is size on size to fit through this stuff. As you saw, it, it slid perfectly through this part of it. You want a little piece of wire or something? No, I, I'm going to have to actually play up that torch and blow that out a bit. <laughs> Light. 
you get your jitters from? Um, Say's jitters. Um, you want to take a look at the key down there. I also have some literature here. If these ones highlighted down here are the one I, ones I use. So if anybody's interested, uh, Say's has a, almost a world lock on the getter market. And it's an Italian company. And they sort of act like an Italian company that, uh, you know, think you need desperate information. We'll get back to you in a couple months. You know, kind of Wait, the purpose of the other types are just to uh, create different effects or get, get different things, like the different types of... Generally, you no, know, they they have different amounts for bigger, for bigger, smaller gas loads. Right. And also they have different ways of activating them. We're going to be activating or heating this using an induction heater. Right. You guys being glass blowers, they do make getters like uh, the two pins on it. So if you can make a uh, two lead press, um, you can hook that up and then just heat it up through like a, a battery right. and, and activate them. Right. So there's lots of that you can see right there in the pictures, uh, the different types. And uh, Wait, when do you have to worry about what size, you know, like if you're doing something very really yep. large, yep. more? Yes. Yeah. And you yeah. can go all the way up from using something small like this to what we call getter ion pump. You can actually seal that on the system and uh, it's better to evacuate most of the air, close off your vacuum system, then activate your getter ion pump, and sucks in all the rest and you just seal off that pump. And how accurate on the other end have to be? Is there a problem if you have one that's too big for the thing no. to use? No. So just have, you'd have unused capacity, right. that's it. Yeah. Good questions, very good questions. When does the getter ion pump require high voltage? I don't think so because all it's doing is it's got a heating element to okay. get these up to a high temperature. Mm -hmm. Let's see if I can just inflate this tube a little bit. Of course, I'm pointing the torch at foam and paper. <laughs> <laughs> Save shop talking about. Yes. <laughs> 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 that would be nice. <laughs> no, I'm fine. <laughs> if you got a stopper, that would be nice. That can make you burn less. All right. <laughs> Sorry. Is that it? Oh, no. All right. Thank you. Good. On a hand for Carrie. She needs a new one. <laughs> <laughs> Now I have to wait till it cools because I don't want to put the zirconium metal next to that hot glass. So you're you want to see something? You're increasing the diameter of that, so that's just fluid. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Maybe you can just talk about your history. Sure. Um, yeah, so I've been doing this since informally in 1983, full time since 1986. Um, trained as an engineer, but always did artwork on the side and whatnot. And, uh, trying to make a, a gas laser skull and gas laser and neon were roughly the same thing, but mirrors and neon and gas laser. I never finished the gas laser, but once I started making neon, I, and, uh, I also have this side that I hate working for other people. You know, I had a promising engineering career ahead of me. 
I decided in 1986, I'm going to give this a go. <laughs> give up a promising engineering career to make an eon. And I did it on April Fool's Day, by the way. <laughs> and um, it's allowed me a lot of freedom. I've done a lot of consulting, uh, designing products. Uh, I wrote a column, technical column for 10 years. I wrote the previous textbook. Spent six years consulting for corning and lighting products and whatever. And uh, now primarily, I seem to work on lots of committees <laughs> and um, still do things for museums. And a lot of R&D, constant R&D. That's what I really find fun. What inspired you to look into the getter tools as a technique? Because um, I was making a lot of tree forms and uh, I have an eight foot kiln, but it's not deep. And so I want to make the trees and make them really expansive. And so I needed another way to process them. And I thought, oh, see, there's some way I could do this without having to heat the glass. And that's when I came up with getters. And, uh, to my knowledge, nobody has done this before, but I know. I think More it's an awesome idea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Getters have been used before in evacuated tubes, though. Right. Also, vacuum right. applications. Yeah, they, they. But like in Geisler tubes, or no, uh, Geisler tubes. Look, you keep know Geisler from the nineteenth century. He started in the soul field. Um, actually, the other ones, one of the experimenters found certain materials, phosphorus, phosphorus pentoxide, and all those other things. You grab water vapor, and those are the first getters. And then they went on to use other things. And uh, the history of getters is fascinating uh, to a geek like me. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> there we go. <laughs> okay. Now, go back to what I was. I'll connect the vacuum pump and the gauge. So. Watch the absolute pressure gauge. Those of you who are not familiar with vacuum, You're sucking air. You're just going down. It's going? Yeah. No, I think I just took it on. Yeah, so most pressure gauges that you have on, you know, like tanks and all, those are a reference to atmospheric pressure. So they start with atmospheric pressure and go up. This uh, is based on vacuum, full vacuum. So zero is full vacuum. So when I fill it, I'm going to vacuum up to a certain pressure. So I'm just gonna let that <laughs> pump down a bit. This is, by the way, very, very crude vacuum. And as I write and do an example in my book, um, most vacuum uh, systems have a gauge here. It tells you, oh, the vacuum is X. And we, I did some tests for the book. I put a vacuum pump at the end of a an actual piece, and I'm talking something with a great conductance, should be very easy to pump, and chartered the two together, and very often the far end of the piece is 100, is 100 times as much gas as at the vacuum pump. It's a, it's a conductance problem, I talked about it. So um, be very wary if you're just doing this evacuation and baking technique that the Readings you get at your vacuum system are far different from what's inside your uh, piece. There's a way to get around that without expensive uh, gauging. If I could have the lights off again here, I can show you. It's not hurting. 
Where are you waiting? Yeah. yeah. I think this, these are funny things with the turn around. Oh, there we go. There we go. Lights. So this this is a testing coil here, and you can see what's going on. <laughs> um, and that's indicative of a lot of air still left in the system. And um, another way to do this, and uh, type of power supplies we use to light these things up. This is a plasma power supply. It's high voltage, but at a high frequency. Uh, people like to think of it, even though it's not technically true, it's broadcasting power. For example, this piece right here is being lit up from one end and power is going up in and capacitively coupling to ground. So it's coming out, essentially going out to ground. So there's only one connection. So the same with this one, if I turn this on and if I plug it in. <laughs> yes. That's not a uh, DC high voltage. That's, that's high frequency. So you can see, I can monitor everything that's going on while I process this um, just by having this on. And that's just a piece of metal tape. It's a piece of aluminum you know, uh, tape. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do the best way of processing any tube that's filled with gas is not to bring, try to get a vacuum in it because it just takes too long. And I could talk for an hour about why. Because as you get lower and lower and lower uh, with the amount of gas in here, the molecules go into this regime where they're essentially just randomly walking around, bouncing around until they find a hole to leave. That takes forever. If you do an actual plot down uh, of a vacuum tube, it takes hours and hours and hours to get down there. A better way to do this um, is flow through pumping. And I'll just show you briefly through this off. what happens. So I've got that neon gas here. And if you just watch the end here. So I just took and pushed all that air right out like that, as opposed to literally spending three hours in, in a um, you know, vacuum system. Um, Is that yeah. similar to a purging technique? Yeah. Okay. And um, I might do this a couple times because there were side arms here that still had air in them. So I will do this a few times because that air is. <clears throat> but this method of actually looking to see what's in there is better than any vacuum gauge you can buy. Because you can actually see the quality, and particularly the neon, because it is uh, so easily seen. It's the brightest of all the gases we light up. So what I'm going to do now is um, I might need a lakes on our heads, please. <laughs> I'm going to um, close the vacuum system, put a bunch of neon in here, and then evacuate it down to about six tor. That's my final pressure, and then I will seal it off. But before I do that, Carrie was supposed to remind me. <laughs> I want to induction heat this um, electrode. And you'll see it. I hate to do this to you guys because we've got lights off again. So, <laughs> watch how fast this gets up to temperature. See, that's already up to about 1800 degrees, full incandescence. The glass is completely cold. That's, that's baking off any impurities in the metal. That's one of the things that uh, you have to do to use this technique. They, don't they coat it with something to do this sort of similar thing like the, on the, the getter? They have a, a, a coating that has, does two things. One's called an emission coating, but it happens to work as a getter too. Uh, uh, the emission coating is made up of barium, another really good getter material, uh -huh. but it also um, lowers what they call the work function. So uh, you lose voltage just going from that metal to gas. But with that coating, that uh, amount of voltage you lose is, is much a bit more limited. But yes, if I didn't induction heat that, 
that uh, produces tons of gas, which will contaminate the system. So what I'm gonna do is fill this, seal it off, and um, then I'm gonna put, roll this getter down inside of that cup, and then heat that cup up again, and that will activate the getter. Now, the reason I do that, these little pills are very, very hard for an indu ordinary induction heater to see. As a matter of fact, they're just invisible. I can heat the cup up easily. And so I'm heating the getter by heating the cup. We did just have a, a brilliant young friend from power supply designer from the Norway. He actually made me a custom megahertz induction heater that heats these pills directly, but then a really special so piece I, of gear. I guess there's, there's just a little metal cup in the bottom. Yes, it's the electrode shell. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 So you just so, rattle the getter down yeah. into it. Right. Megahertz, are you going to have the FCC knocking at your door, Wayne? <laughs> they have to get in line with all the other specs. <laughs> <laughs> um, lights, please. Thank you. <clears throat> so, shut this down. And by the way, I'm hoping this is all going to work. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a little bit iffy, you know. So, I'm going to put lots of gas in here. Say, I put like 50 tour, and I'm just going to slowly bring this down to get close to six. Let's see it, but that kind of purplish neon color means it's still thoroughly contaminated with air and more probably water vapor, which is the worst contaminated contamination uh, source in any vacuum system. And that's because it damages the electrode? Um, it le lights preferentially over the neon. Virtually all contaminants will light before inner gases. And so they will rob the brightness out of, out of things. You have to worry about backstreaming with the oil pump? Not really. Um, if, if you were doing pump down rather than flow through, yes, because okay. it's a time thing. And you have to get this down into the molecular flow region where you back. The backstream has got to find its way all the way through all this. So, yeah. spots. <laughs> What he's mentioning, uh, backstreaming is the oil in this pump actually volatilizes. So when you get down in the molecular flow region, gas molecules are going this way, pump oil is going back into your system. I think it's around six, does it look like 60? <laughs> yeah, that looks good. Okay. Um, so now I'm just going to seal off. I'm supposed to remind you to tip off both ends. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you laugh. <laughs> you go to pick up your piece out of the kiln and have it, uh, or uh, whatever, you have to snap off one end. Can you hold this tube moving, please, quickly? Reach. I'm going to tip this off a little long in case this doesn't work for some reason. Yeah. 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 
Okay, now so the tube is now filled with whatever it's filled with, mostly neon, but still a substantial uh, proportion of <clears throat> impurities. So now, this is where I hit it on the ceiling and break it open. <laughs> so now, this is sort of game. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to look it up before I activate the getter. Let's um, turn the lights off and you can see what a thoroughly contaminated tube looks like. So you can obviously they see there's neon in there, but this purple magenta, which actually is a nice color, um, is um, a mixture of neon and probably a lot of water vapor and some components of air, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon dioxide. They, they stick to the inside uh, wall and water is really pernicious. It not only adsorbs, on the surface, but absorbs into the bulk. And so now, and just note how lavender it is right here. Because now I'm gonna turn this off. And I'm gonna induction heat this cup again. By the way, this is um, not only the temperature you heat it to, but the time. So oftentimes you don't do this heating just once. You may heat it like over the first 24 hours a few times because it will keep reactivating and reactivating and reactivating the getter. Let's heat it a few times over like a minute. Is that happening just because it, it, it's, it's loosening up the oxide layer of the water? Yeah, exactly. Rid of it? it's, it's loosening it up and going down into the bulk of the zirconium. Right. Cools. <clears throat> I just want to show you something that that little tube that I told you about. So this one was atmospheric pressure air. It was just to get her in it only. Now it's a pure argon filled tube and nothing else. <laughs> so if it were no, air no. for people who've done it, uh, it would be like a bluish, a faint bluish. Right. How much of a volume, of a volume will those getters absorb? That is a really good question and difficult to calculate sure, and difficult to even to get the manufacturer's reps to weigh in. Uh, they're really good at selling, they know part numbers and whatever you ask them. It, it can be calculated. It's, um, it's it's quite an effort. You'd have to go into a lot of literature from like NASA and things who they know about, you know, surface layer. Of projects. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's got to depend on the nature of the air that you are getting right. to. Yeah. <laughs> so now this has been activated. Can you see this is orange here? So as this runs, we can leave it. Actually, it's already it's less um, bluish than it was. And we'll even leave, leave this running, I guess, during the day. Um, check on it and slowly over time, all these impurities will have to work their way down to be absorbed. So this is not like a, an American pill. <laughs> work right away. Um, it's more a very Italian pill. pill. Yeah, it's an Italian <laughs> pill. <laughs> Take your pill, have some coffee, come back. <laughs> but you can see uh, coming out of here is no longer that uh, color of air. It's actually pure neon. And like I say, eventually it will look like this. You can see here, this is exactly how this looks 
uh, 24 hours. Um, it's just a matter of what they call diffusion constants. Is, um, the time it takes for this model. Careful with that technique. Oh. Is yes, you want to use good magnets, but if you're not used to use uh, working with good magnets, be careful <laughs> because when they come together, I've had a number of glass pieces just explode. And uh, so, should I tell them that no. Mike Reinhardt's story? Or, uh, <laughs> yeah. This old friend who's got more stories than shake a stick at. So, back when these super magnets came out, somebody came to their high tech company. And the salesman said, whatever you do, don't put these anywhere near together. So the engineering manager says, okay, I'll put one in each pocket. There's now a soprano sitting with us. So I'm going to heat this up a little more. That's a true story, by the way. <laughs> That's one from my memoirs. Because a lot, a lot of the gases are evolving from the glass, the water vapors. Over the. By the way, uh, we think we're so uh, sophisticated and superior nowadays. Gary and I have been doing uh, research for perhaps my next book on a. a researcher back around 1890s, 1900, where he made tubes to light whole buildings that were up to 275 feet long, individual tubes made on site. And he actually came up with a way, uh, essentially a gettering technique to take atmospheric air, pass it through a getter in, of his own devising and leave pure nitrogen in the tube. Mm -hmm. And somehow, and I don't know how he did it, was able to light a 275 foot long tube. And it comes out almost perfect white. And um, <clears throat> yeah, anybody interested, I'd love to, to build one of these things. If anybody wants to, to do an interesting project, maybe do it through a museum like the Schenectady Museum or some place that's uh, attached to, you know, that kind of stuff. But, uh, I, we, we made some tubes 32 feet long. They were hard to light up. I don't know how he got 275 feet, but we actually have many, many pictures. He did a whole um, train stations in, in London Underground. It lit up till World War II, though. At one time, the New York Post Office York was Post lit. Office. Uh, the whole interior was lit with a these tiny tubes. tubes. A one single tube, yeah. tube that was custom <laughs> wow. bent to, to fit That's the interior so cool. architecture. There used to be a... a, 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 a it's pretty long. <laughs> Turn it together. Yeah, right. oh, he's got, all his patents showed came up all these custom ways of holding things and making T seals, all the stuff. He was working with uh, two inch um, soda line glass. Oh, yeah, he was doing this on site, you know, and uh, they worked. Wow. And he had to do on site at the post office or whatever. Oh, yeah. And, and not only was I don't still know how he did not only was he doing straight tubes and but he's making curves on site. Curves. <laughs> curves. <laughs> on a two inch soda line. Well, that's control. And, uh, <laughs> truly amazing. <laughs> he, he was a contemporary. He actually worked in Edison's shop and he thought, I can do better than your light bulbs. And he did. And he also worked for Tesla. <laughs> and they were part of the big three. Everybody remembers Tesla and Edison. But Edison um, bought up all of more stuff and actively tried to make him disappear from history, which he did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and actually, um, Moore had to work for uh, GE, um, Edison's company, and um, poor guy um, was shot to death in his front lawn by a rival inventor. Oh. Yeah. It made worldwide news back in the 1930s. <laughs> So let that be a lesson to you. Don't invent anything. <laughs> what are the questions? I know it's kind of a usual topic. <laughs> yep. Anything else? Uh, Sorry, what was the question? Uh, of using uh, materials that uh, produce a vapor. 
uh, two that can be used, uh, common ones are mercury, half of all neon tubes are called, are actually have mercury vapor. And what we do is use a lot of iodine um, and iodine vapor um, picture. Oh, well, actually right in the cover here, this is an iodine discharge here. It's a krypton iodine. It's a, the brightest of all gas mixes. It makes a very intense, thin, slowly meandering line. And uh, just the use of iodine takes a little bit of time to understand. It's very toxic and uh, <laughs> it also can be pumped away. You have to keep it spray with a cooling spray <clears throat> while it's being pumped or the tube's being pumped or it'll essentially just disappear into your vacuum pump. Why don't you have problems with it being a real No, we haven't. No. No. Other questions? Yeah, thank you. Yeah.